Well, hey everybody, and welcome to our session in Hebrews chapter 12. Today we're going to be covering verses 12 through 17. Now you'll notice that when we begin, uh, verse 12 starts with the word, therefore which, of course, draws our attention back to what had happened in, already in the previous context. Uh, a few important things that I want to highlight from that context, just to get us up to speed, is that in the Hall of Faith, the author has showed us, and this is important, that everyone who has faith makes it. And God will perfect every one of his people at the end together. So there's this community emphasis. And that's why the author said, to you now, who's, who's in this generation, lay aside sin and fix your eyes on Christ in faith because you are the people of faith in this generation and run with endurance. Keep on believing, is what he's saying, which is fine and good when life is easy. But admittedly, life gets really hard. And it's sometimes hard to keep on believing when our life just turns into chaos. And the readers were seeing ahead of them on their path death and difficulty and violence from sinners were ahead for them. But the author is saying that shouldn't weaken your faith because remember what he's just said in the previous context. You face those things, every one of them, in every way, at every time, in every moment, you face those things as beloved sons and daughters of God. God is not against you. And when you look to Jesus, the Son of God, when you see that He had death and difficulty and violence ahead of Him, as He looked to the cross, you see that in His case, it was loud and clear that God was for Him and that none of those circumstances jeopardized anything of God's plan to bring him to glory. And similarly, God's sovereign over all your circumstances and he designs them in all of their details to discipline you and develop you and refine you as you make it to the end. The author is effectively asking, do you know that? That he has your best in mind and that when you enter the storms of life, the wind is at your back because he is bringing you with his omniscient and omnipotent hand to share in his holiness. You'll make it, is what he's saying, because he loves you and because he is working in you. And so having clarified these encouragements for them, now, in our text, as we get started here, he's calling for two crucial responses to God's love for his children. And you'll see why these are so crucial as we go through the text, I think. But make no mistake about it, as we just start, I want you to know that without these responses, there is great reason to fear not making it. Because these are responses uh, wrought by God's grace working in you as you trust the promises of God. So these are two crucial responses to God's love for you. And we're going to see the first one in verses 12 and 13. The first crucial response is to protect one another with hope. Protect one another with hope. Now, you know, it's like the helmet of the hope of salvation. Hope is like your armor. It's acting as armor. That idea is similarly expressed, essentially, in verses 12 and 13. Now, your cross-references in your Bible will alert you to the fact that verse 12 is really a quotation of Isaiah 35. And verse 13 begins with a quotation of Proverbs 4. And so we'll take those in turn as we go through this text. Um, the reason I'm speaking about hope is because the atmosphere of Isaiah 35 is charged with hope. And that is the ground by which he can say what he says in uh, verse 12 here. That text just shines forth the hope that God is with you, that God is for you, that God will show up for you, that he will fulfill his promises to you. And hope is just loud and clear in that text. What we see here as we go through this text is really just the way that hope uh, protects you. 
And so we begin with our first one in verse 12. Uh, the one way that hope will protect you is that it strengthens you up. Hope strengthens you up. Isaiah 35 is all about what to do because you have hope, because God has not abandoned you, because he's not far off from you. I want you to see that it will provide strength and it will provide strength for the exact areas that are weak and feeble. It's not just some general help. It's actually a precise help. It deals exactly with the problem where it's needed. It's the exact prescription you need. And that's because what you need when you're in a state of hopelessness is God. And what your hope is, is the hope of God. Now these are pictures of weakness, right? Hands that are weak and knees that are feeble. And the idea is that they're ready to give out. They're just ready to throw in the towel. If you've ever been feeling that way, where you just want to quit because life is so hard and your faith is so small, it seems, and weak, You don't need a bigger sight of your own strength. You don't need to self-medicate with a look to your own uh, ability to endure. You need a bigger sight of God. And that will give you hope. And that will strengthen you. Because honestly, your hope is that you will see God. Think about this. One day with your eyes, you will see God in all His glorious majesty with infinite power and love, show up and bless you in the future. That's why you don't need to despair. As Psalm 27, 13 says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the glory of the Lord. In other words, I despair if I didn't have hope in God. And so here we can see, it's interesting how he says, strengthen the hands. It's a command. Now, the question is, are these your hands, or, or whose hands are these? And if you read Isaiah, you see that it, it's actually a uh, community-focused command. It's reciprocal. It's you strengthening someone else and someone else strengthening you. It, it has the idea of this is what is to course through the community of faith. And you may know what that's like when somebody encourages you or gives you help in some way or hope in some way. It's easier to then give it to others, isn't it? You're passing it on. And what I want to highlight for you here is just the simple fact that you do have a ministry of encouraging others that God is not against them in their struggles, that he wants to grow them to be like Jesus. And really to get down into the details when you're hanging out with other Christians, get to talking about this. Ask them what's been challenging to you lately. Ask them what they think the Lord's been teaching them lately. Ask them what's been difficult in life lately and talk about those things and be sure to rekindle the fires of their hope in God. Show them how God is not small and God's not far off, but as Psalm 46 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in danger. And as you show them God, That will strengthen their weak hands and knees, and it will put strength in their soul. That's the first way hope protects us. And the second is that hope will not just strengthen you up, but it will straighten you out. The text says, And make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame will not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. This is walking the path of holiness. This is walking in line with the truths of the gospel. Not turning aside to sin, not chasing worldly things. But because you have hope in God, you pursue God directly. That's who you want. And the benefit of this is seen as you look at this little phrase here, so that. In in addition, in like manner to this reciprocal idea, it says, The limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. I want you to picture this person. Those who have been wounded by sin, or just the weariness of the world those who are heavy-hearted, those who just want to despair and give up. Picture that person. Picture that person's spiritual weakness. What does that person need? I guarantee you, you will meet this person. You might be thinking about a specific person in your life. You might be that person in this instance. What does that person need? 
One thing that person needs is to be around people who live in hope in God. And people who live in hope live holy lives. That's the straight path here. It's the path of holiness, according to Proverbs. And the clear implication is, if you want healing, healing comes when you are on the path of holiness. That's the straight path. That's the path that when you walk on it, those who are wounded and those who maybe you can think of like if you have if you've had a rolled ankle or an injured joint and you need to rest it, it's not good to just go in, into reckless activity. But the peace and the place of healing that the author outlines here is on the path of holiness. The danger is in sin, not in holiness. The healing is in holiness. The author is saying that we should be making a straight path forward to protect one another. Because if we are the cause of sin, we can even damage one another. Hope is what helps us to get set to do that kind of thing. To press on in the straight path of holiness. So that's point one, is to protect one another with hope. And let the hope of salvation be in your conversation with others. And when you talk to people... I mean, do you give them hope in God? Are others around you getting reminded often enough of the hope of their salvation? The author is saying, that's exactly the kind of thing we all need. That's the fuel and the engine that will get us onward. That will help us make it. And so having settled them in hope and shown them how that's supposed to protect us, the author now begins to show us how to move forward. And that's, this is point two in verses 14 to 17. We'll change color here. Now, the first response was to protect one another with hope. And the second crucial response to God's love is to pursue one another's holiness. And I'll read verse 14 here just to get us introduced to this. Pursue peace with all men. And the sanctification, the progressive holiness, growth and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Now this idea of pursuing, this is a zealous, whole-souled, kind of inspired pursuit of a goal. And what I want to be very clear with is showing you that this is what hope will bring to you. This is not pursuing this in in a spirit of dread, of uh, being frightened. This is not pursuing growth and holiness uh, in just a panic and uncertainty. This is pursuing these kinds of things with hope. You know who God is for you. As the context says, you know that God is committed to growing all of his children to be and share in his perfect holiness. He's supplying the power to do that. And because he's working in you and in them, you can confidently join in and participate in the pursuit of those things because he's already begun it and been committed to perfecting that. And you're participating in the current of that. And you can see why to pursue this really in two ways. And we'll... Uh, summarize the first one in verse 14 as just the promise of holiness. The promise of holiness. He specifically commands us to pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Now, what I want you to see here is how all-inclusive this is. This is pursue peace with all men, which is contrasted with the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Everyone needs this sanctification and everyone should be experiencing this peace. No one should be left out is the idea. Everyone's involved here. Everyone needs to know these realities. You again have the idea of reciprocation where you're pursuing this with them and they're pursuing that with you. Now what I want to show you too is again, this is hope fueled. This peace Contextually, earlier in the chapter, is the fruit of God's working in someone. God's discipline does not uh, initially appear joyful but sorrowful, and afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit. Secondly, this holiness is what God is working forward, uh, working 
for you uh, to have in discipline as well. He disciplines you that you may share in his holiness. And so it's all the fruit of God's gracious work in you. And yet you're called to pursue this. And what this challenges us to see is, one, this is not man-made. We can't invent the idea of peace because this pursuit is one that uh, pursues these things together. This is a holy peace that you're supposed to enjoy. And this is a, uh, a holiness that is characterized by peace. Now, this is a relationship where there's forgiveness and there's love and there's patience. That you're loving others the way you would want to be loved. There's not bickering and backbiting and bitterness between you, but there's harmony and agreement in holiness. And what, what this challenges us to see is that if there's somebody or some people in your life that you are not willing to pursue peace with, and you're not willing to share in gospel grace with, it challenges the idea and says, hey, maybe you're not pursuing the sanctification. If you're not progressing in sanctification, or I'll say it this way, if you're not progressing in peace, you're not progressing in holiness. Because God designs you to share in his peace and share in his holiness. And so it causes you to question that. And if you're not sharing in his holiness, the author says, without this holiness, no one will see the Lord. No one will see the Lord. And yes, again, this, this holiness is all of grace. This holiness comes to you as you receive God's grace to you in the gospel. But the point here is that your life's relationships with others matter and, and this is important. It's not just you and Jesus. This is peace with all men and collective uh, pursuing of sanctification. This matters. And if you're having difficulty pursuing peace with others, what you need to do is realize the way God has pursued peace with you. And then when you're just thrilled by that and so overwhelmed by that love, then you pass that forward as it all starts with the Lord and courses through the Christian community. And again, the seriousness of this is that no one will see the Lord without this kind of holiness because God would not have been working in that person, right? And yet the promise and the reason he's commanding them to this is because it's true that God is working in them. God is working in them. You can pursue this. You can know this peace. You can know this progress in holiness. Because you will see the Lord one day because he has set his love on you in Christ. So go and just run forward and pursue those things in hope. And that's the positive side of this. And the second reason to pursue holiness in one another is uh, really outlined in the next three verses as we close, which we'll call the, the perils of unholiness. And here the author shows us why to pursue peace with one another. And he says, see to it. Your Bible might say something different, but the idea is to provide overwatch, to, to watch out for each other, to look to protect one another. It's kind of like the idea of a, a guide on an expedition to ascend Mount Everest. There's all kinds of dangers, and they go up in teams. It's a dangerous journey, and if someone doesn't follow the path up, they could perish. And people get low on oxygen, people become irrational, people are just careless, people are arrogant, and they can quickly end up a casualty in a matter of moments because they just weren't careful. And the guides are the ones who try to especially make sure that everyone makes it. They're trying to look out for those signs of carelessness or the signs of dangers that are coming and, and put an end to those things. They provide overwatch for the team. And that idea is, is like what the author says is the responsibility of, and catch this, every Christian, not just pastors, not just care group leaders, not just spiritual elders, but this is for every Christian. There are warning signs and dangers to look out for within our community of believers. And the author highlights three of them. He does it with his phrase that we can kind of see in English. It's this, no one. And no root of bitterness, it's the same phrase in Greek, and no immoral person or godless person. And the, the phrase here really is not anyone. See to it that not anyone comes short, which means this can happen to anyone. 
No one's exempt from these dangers, right? So with that in mind, let's read. Beginning for the first one in verse 15, we watch out for the first of three kinds of scenarios. Number one, someone deficient in grace. Someone who comes short of the grace of God. Meaning they come short of it so as to lack it. They do not have it. And to be clear, this is not saying God's not gracious. This means that they're not receiving His grace the way in which He gives His grace. It means they're not coming to, in the, in the theology of Hebrews, the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help through Christ. They're, they're not coming to Christ in faith because faith in Christ always receives grace. There's not a person on the planet who has ever had faith and not received the grace of God. And this is, these are people who, he's saying, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. These, these people could be with you physically and yet not with you spiritually. And so a proper response to this is, to make sure that you are passing and giving grace onward to them, to seize every occasion to to point them to God and His grace in your words and in your actions and what you talk about, to point them to the grace to be cherished in Christ. And Christian, just to highlight this, you have grace to give. Because you pursue holiness, it might bring you to come short of or lack many things in life that other people enjoy. You may have rights taken from you from the government. You may have possessions confiscated from you. Your own pursuit of holiness might make you part way with certain things that other people who aren't pursuing holiness enjoy. Things that just weigh you down on your way to heaven. But as you come to the throne of Christ, one thing you will never lack is grace for your every need. The omnipotent power of God to work for you, for His glory. You'll never lack that. So help others know that reality too, so that no one comes short of the grace of God. That's the first person. The second is also in verse 15, that someone defiling others. This is a very interesting thing. It says, no root of bitterness springing up causing trouble. And by it, many be defiled, many be defiled through one person, or possibly a root of bitterness. Now, this is not somebody who is bitter necessarily, but it's a quotation from Deuteronomy uh, 29, where it's kind of the idea of a poisonous root that comes up in the garden and negatively affects other plants, springing up, causing trouble. Now, what I want you to just highlight in on here is that trouble and defilement are working directly against the peace and holiness, respectively, that you are to pursue. And this is saying, if someone in your team, in your group, is springing up and is uh, causing trouble and defiling others, that that cannot be allowed to continue. That has to be corrected or uh, something has to be done uh, to just preserve the, the sanctity of the community from the negative influences of that. So watch out for that, is what he's saying. And pursue holiness and peace and just work to get rid of and put an end to this kind of thing uh, where you can. Now, thirdly, um, in the last two verses, this negative um, example, the peril of unbelief, really is um, someone, we could say, dealing with the devil entering into a deal with the devil. Someone who's shallow, worldly-minded, leaves God, trashes his promises for just present, passing happiness. Someone who's just secular-minded. We've talked about in previous videos uh, the devil's bargain, how uh, the devil will bring you to give up Christ and give up the promises of God for some sort of earthly pleasure that is outside uh, the promises of God. That's how he tempted Christ. That's how he tempted uh, Adam and Eve. He said, you should have this outside of the word of God. God has already given you everything, but you should have this um, and and tempted them away from that. And ultimately it um, caused the fall itself. But here uh, the author highlights, he says, let there be no, not anyone among you who's an immoral or godless person like Esau. So he highlights Esau. 
Why? Well, if the devil's going to tempt you out of what is yours by God's word into uh, something just worldly, what was what were the promises, so to say, for, for Esau? It was his own birthright. The promised inheritance that was his from his father in the line of Abraham and Isaac. The, the promised rights of the firstborn. They were his, and it was only a matter of time before he received them. And that's much like how the promises function for Christians. They're ours. All these things that Christ has promised us, it's just a matter of time until we really inherit them. But with Esau, he had no regard for God. He was godless. His desires were not Godward. He was immoral. And because of that, he desired blessing, but he did not desire God. And he exchanged, he sold what was his by promise for a single, tiny, passing meal, a bowl of soup, as it says in Genesis. And that should shock you, just those two things. It shows how careless sin can make you and and a shallow, godless mindset can make you. To toss away your inheritance and enter into the devil's bargain What the author says is the chilling reality that there's no coming back from that. We really need to look out for this kind of carelessness. We really need to be encouraging each other to prize Christ more than we do and not treat him lightly. Because in verse 17 it says, in his case, for you know that even afterwards, on the tail end of it, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance though he sought for it, that is the blessing, with tears. He highlights two things, puts them up next to each other to compare Esau's desire to inherit the blessings, his tearful pursuit of that, met this wall of a reality that he was rejected and found no place for repentance. He was unrepentant. And that's because God's blessings come through God's promises. They come through God's word. God's blessings come through faith in God's promises. Because that way it's all of grace. And as you see in Romans 9, it says it does not depend on man who wills or man who runs. And we can say in this case, the man who cries after something or the man who desires something. It does not depend on man, but it depends on God who has mercy. And his mercy is shown in Christ through his promises in the gospel. And the way in which you handle and hear those promises is so important. Faith will treasure Christ above everything else, but as you see, the unbelief and faithlessness of Esau will trade the promises of God for anything else. The author is saying, pursue peace and holiness. God's grace is working in your life, and because of that, none of these circumstances will really touch the children of God. God is preserving you from these things. God is preventing you from these things. As you pursue holiness and seek to care for each other, you know that these will not be the end of you. This is not your end because God has begun a good work in you. And so I hope that this helps you to see why these are two crucial responses to God's love for us and helps you just understand more of God as you study Hebrews.